name is Kimber Lanning, and I'm the founder and director of Local First Arizona. We're going to cover a lot of ground tonight, um, talking about how creative ideas for collaborations to grow your companies. Uh, we may have other people sneaking in here, um, so uh, just FYI, you may have other people nestling up as the night goes on. Um, so the first thing I want to do is give a big shout out to Because Event Space. Um, thank you. This is a wonderful space. How many of you have been here before? Right? Isn't this a nice facility? It's really, really nice. And then um, a shout out to Amici Catering. Um, they do all amazing, and they, they source locally as much as possible. So did you have a chance to have a bite to eat? What was it? Good? Okay. Wonderful. And then finally, um, Arizona Federal Credit Union. Um, those of you that know much about Local First Arizona may know that Arizona Federal Credit Union is a longtime partner of ours, but we're big supporters of credit unions and local banks because they lend back into the local business community at a much higher rate than the big banks. So we're going to be talking to you a little bit about systems, maybe bring some things to your attention that you hadn't thought about before, uh, some big top line things that Local First Arizona is working on, and then we're going to dig into some actual concrete examples that I hope you will all enjoy. So we're going to get started thinking about Local First, and um, my background, some of you know me, I'm an entrepreneur. I have a music store that I've had for 30 years. And uh, I started Local First Arizona really with two things on my mind. One of them was that I wanted to connect more people to this place. Um, two thirds of us here in Arizona came from somewhere else. And uh, there's too many people standing around uh, feeling unaccountable for things because they've only lived here 10 or 15 years. And my role is to make people who grew up here want to stay here and to get people who've relocated here to feel really connected. And part of the way they're going to feel connected is by connecting and building relationships with the local entrepreneurs that are here. So we really want to work together, uh, you and I, uh, to try to figure out how we can best position you in the middle of this huge local movement. Uh, the second thing that was on my mind was I wanted to create a level playing field for the independent businesses to be able to survive. Now, most people think business is business, but what we did at Local First Arizona is we uncovered a whole lot of inequity, uh, massive amounts of subsidies going to chain stores and other big national companies that creates an unlevel playing field for us to compete on. And so we've really advanced that conversation so that we can have a very real look at the true cost of all those subsidies. So I'm going to dig in today talking just kind of broadly about the work that we do. And we're going to talk about how the economy works because you need to be able to talk about it in your work, in your businesses, whatever they may be. So Local First Arizona today is the largest local business coalition in North America. We have 3,200 members and we're growing at a rate of about 60 to 80 new businesses a month. That kind of um, growth, would, I would encourage you to be close to us, um, to come out to events whenever you have an opportunity to, because there are other like-minded businesses that you may be able to form collaborations with or learn from. So ultimately, we are focused on business retention and business expansion. If economic development were a five-pointed star, we would look at incubators and startups, we would look at business retention, business expansion, and then the fifth one is business attraction. Now, business attraction gets all of the attention, and we are really working hard to make business retention and expansion stronger. And that's in terms of an economic development strategy from our cities and state. Too often, they look at how do we attract some outside company to move in rather than looking at all of your businesses and asking how we could uh, begin to support them. So we're also really very interested in placemaking and branding and marketing for your businesses. We work really diligently to make sure that local businesses get the credit for the environment they create. It's the local businesses that create the culture and the sense of place. Um, and too often, um, we get brushed aside as being, you know, small business is important, but then when it comes down to policy, we don't really uh, have a seat at the table. So we worked really hard on placemaking, which is using arts and culture to make sure that local businesses are um, in the forefront of the conversation. Um, Placemaking is where people feel connected to place and leveraging arts and culture to make sure that people do feel connected to place, okay? And then we're going to be talking about clustering and value chains as well. Just to give you some background, we really believe that at the root of collaboration is this thing called clustering. A lot of times you'll hear that tech companies use that word clustering, but we like to cluster small businesses together. It can be retailers, it can be restaurants, but it can be all kinds of service providers as well. 
Um, ultimately, our message is that we're stronger together, and you're here tonight because I know you want to learn about how you can begin to collaborate and think outside the box. So the first thing, is there any way to reduce the size of this image so that it's all on the screen? If you look at the sides, you can actually see the entire slide. Um, in any case, um, the first thing I want to get you thinking about is connection to place. And so I, this is a true story. I started Local First Arizona um, because I was standing in line next to a woman, just chit-chatting with a stranger from Chicago. Now, how many of us know someone from Chicago that won't stop telling us how great Chicago is? It's a lot. Arguably, they have more hometown pride than any place else in the country. And it's a great town, don't get me wrong. But we have a whole lot of folks in Chicago, uh, or in Arizona, that are still telling us how great Chicago is. So I put this slide up here to get us thinking about um, connection. And why do those people feel so connected to Chicago that they're still telling us about it? So this is a true story. I was standing in line next to this woman. We're chit-chatting. And at one point, um, you know, I was thinking to myself, yeah, she's going on about Chicago. I've heard it all before. I'm an Arizona girl. And then she kind of lowered her voice and she leaned into me as if confidentially and she said, boy, you guys sure have made a mess out here in Arizona. And I was kind of de defensive about that. You know, I thought, well, um, and I'm processing. And she said, you guys. So I said, um, you don't live here. And she said, no, I live here. And I said, no, you haven't lived here very long then. And she said, no, I lived here 15 years. So I said, well, who the heck is you guys then? She was so disconnected that anything that happened in Arizona, she thought it was somebody else in Arizona, that she wasn't even counting herself as an Arizona. Now, this is important because locally owned businesses play a key role in the way people feel about their place. So after I had this conversation with this woman, I pushed back on her a little bit in the moment, and I found out that she had never voted. I found out that when she gave charitably, she gave back in Illinois. Now, I said that to all of you that if we want to fix the education system here in Arizona, first we need to build a community that feels accountable for it, right? Too many people standing around going, well, what do you want me to do about it? I just got here 20 years ago. <laughs> so, so I, st I set out and I started doing my little independent survey of everyone that I could find from Chicago. And I simply just asked them one question. Tell me why you love Chicago so much. Just tell me why you love Chicago so much. And my smile grew bigger and bigger. Because they told me in a million ways and in a million different voices, they told me the locally owned businesses. They said, without a doubt, uh, in Chicago, man, I used to have the same barber for 40 years. They said, I banked at the same bank that my great-grandparents banked at. They said things like, I loved all the little shops. I used to know all the little owners in my neighborhood. Or they say things like, then I had my favorite restaurants. I would just pop in and they'd say, hey, Steve, you know, you want the regular? That's about relationships. They didn't even realize what they were telling me was the locally owned businesses helped them feel rooted. Now, you can take the same person and move them to Phoenix, Arizona, and maybe they don't have that behavior anymore. Maybe they don't seek out the locally owned businesses, and they end up at the big chains, and then they don't build those relationships. I mean, the same guy that said, I had the same barber for 40 years in Chicago, he finished that by saying, you know, all you guys have out here in Phoenix is super cuts. And I was like, wow, how interesting. I go, give me 20 minutes, I'll find you 20 barbers. He goes, really? Where? Isn't that interesting? I said, well, you need to slow down because you're driving too fast past all of our cool independent stuff. We need to work really hard as Arizonans to better connect people to our place. Why is this important? It's important because it turns out the Knight Foundation issued this study that's called the Soul of the Community. And they found that when people truly love their place, they're more likely to vote, they're more likely to volunteer, to give charitably, they're even more likely to pay their taxes. So I'm telling you this today because I want you to think of your business as a key reason that people love this place. That you, as a small business owner in Phoenix, Arizona, or Scottsdale, you are building relationships. What's happening across the world right now, for those of you that are watching the media very closely, What's happening in the world of business is that there are two camps forming, and they are two very distinct camps of different kinds of people with a different mindset. Group number one is focused, number one priority is going to be convenience. And they are moving to an online um, environment where they're not very concerned with who they're doing business with, they're not thinking about where their money goes, okay? 
The other group is forming on the other side, and those are people who are placing a priority on relationships. Those are people who are spending their money with companies where they know the owner, they want to be in relationship with that owner, they want to know where their money goes when they spend it and who they're in relationship with. That group is growing faster than anyone ever thought that they would be. Now, I just read, there's a brand new study that just came out that showed that um, chain stores, who's in the middle, are the people that are not offering convenience and they're not offering, um, they're not offering uh, relationships. They're actually the ones who are crumbling first. And I talk about chains and you think about retail, but chains can be any kind of big, huge, nationally owned company. Could be any company that you're competing with on a daily basis. So if they're not offering convenience or relationships, they're going to be in a world of hurt. What I'm here to tell you is that we, our strongest asset, is that we can build relationships. And that is something that the online environment cannot ever replace. Now some of us are in service, and service is going to last a whole long time because they can't do that online. But the reality is we need to be positioning ourselves to build a relationship with those that we are doing business with because they're more likely to be loyal, they're more likely to stick with you through the hard times, and they're not going to just jump ship over something that looks like greener grass on the other side. Okay? So I'm going to put this slide in here um, before we sort of shift gears and get into collaboration. Because some of you have never heard me talk before. How many of you have heard my talks before? Okay, about five. So I'm just going to hit on this real quickly for those of you in the room that haven't really thought about the way the, the economy works. So I put this slide together, and people, I always joke, you know, in my talks, I talk to all kinds of people. This is the point at which people will take their Starbucks cup and put it underneath uh, the thing, because they think I'm going to pick on Starbucks. But I'm actually station, and the reason is twofold. Number one is they're not in the business of subsidies. Some of you have heard my talk, you know that Cabela's, you know Cabela's out in Glendale? They average $35 million per store in subsidies. Okay, that means they get money from our government to open their door. Okay, out in Glendale, they got a $68 million subsidy, one retail location. They got $68 million. Bass Pro and Mesa got $32 million. Um, Walmart's averaged $25 to $30 million per location, and they did that for over 20 years. So it's really important that we start to think about the fact that that is draining and depleting resources from our parks and our libraries and our fire departments and all of those things uh, that that money should have gone to. So I put Starbucks in here because I like to call them out as the best of the best. They're not in the business of subsidies. In addition, they pay for the health care of their employees. If you take a company like Staples, Staples has 65% part-time employees with no health care benefits. Those employees end up on the state health care plan, and who's paying for that? We are. So, wow. I always pull out people out of the audience and I say, you know what, who loves music? I would, I would offer you 50% off forevermore in my store. Lifetime guaranteed. Cheap, cheap, cheap. All you have to do is pick up the health care for all my employees, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a bum deal, but we do it all the time when we spend our money with companies that aren't thinking about the better benefit for Arizona overall. So back to the slide, Starbucks does not do that. They pay for the health care of their employees, and um, they are not in the business of subsidies. They just pay their own way. Love it. That's what we all do. We pay our own way. Okay. Now this side of the screen represents 15 independent coffee shops randomly chosen. This is 15 Starbucks locations. So you spend your money on a latte. Okay. And then that money goes into the Starbucks coffers, and they have the cost of doing business. How many accountants does Starbucks hire in the state of Arizona? Because they do business here. Any, any accountants have a gig? No? None. How about graphic designers? Anybody hired here? How about website developers or payroll service providers? <coughs> the answer is zero. Those are called secondary jobs, and they make the world go round. Okay. Over here, you have 15 graphic designers at a gig, 15 website developers, 15 payroll service providers, etc. That represents dollars moving through the economy. It's critically important that we factor in the ecosystem of jobs that all of your businesses support and keep that money moving through the economy. Okay, now we can talk about the third time the dollar moves through the economy when the accounting firm hires the local landscaping firm and the local landscaping firm Gets a, gets a new client or a contract, but they're only able to do that because the accounting firm has local businesses that hire them. Okay, 
So at this point um, in my talk, I was giving a talk to a group of graphic design firms. And this woman, uh, she smacked herself in the forehead right in the middle of my talk. Just smacked herself really hard right in the head. And everybody heard it. And I kind of stopped and I was like, oh my gosh. I went up to her and I said, are you okay? She said, yeah. She said, I used to have eight employees and today I have five. And it looks like tomorrow I'm going to have four. And it never occurred to me until right now that I've been spending all of my money with companies that will never hire me. So think about that. She was spending all of her money with big, huge national companies that are never going to hire an Arizona-based graphic design firm with eight, five, or four employees, right? So the purpose of me sharing this with you is as we begin to talk about collaboration, I want you to begin thinking about how your spend, the money that you're spending with your company, can be an opportunity to grow a new client or build a new relationship where that money can come back to you. I always like to remind all of us as business owners, smart money comes back to us. Okay? So if I go to APS, a big huge company like APS, and their goal is to keep the lights on, and they're awarding a bunch of contracts to companies on the other side of the country that they could easily award locally, how smart are they? That money is going away and going to companies that will never turn the lights on. They should be levering their, leveraging their spend in order to grow companies and uh, keep the lights on right here in Arizona. So thinking about this, let's blow this model up of Starbucks across the country. We could have 30,000 Starbucks locations. And they're still only going to support one accounting firm, one graphic design firm, one website development firm. And they're all in the state of Washington. So we, as a community, need to be very mindful of how we're spending our money because we actually know that for every two jobs big national companies create in Arizona, that three local jobs are actually lost as a direct result of local businesses closing down. So we need to be thinking about how we're spending our money to grow our own businesses and also to grow jobs and keep the economy strong and resilient. We want people to be able to afford to go out to lunch and people to be able to afford to eat out at dinner more than once a week. Okay, These are all relevant to what you're doing. Now, in the U.S., when we measure jobs as per $10 million spent, so you spend $10 million in the, uh, across the country and you spend it at local independent businesses, you are going to create and sustain 110 jobs. If you spend that $10 million in chain stores, you're only going to create 50 jobs. Now, we've known this for about 12 years now, but this new study shows that if you spend $10 million on Amazon, you're going to create and sustain only 14 jobs. Now, why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because when we're all spending our money in a way that we're only creating 14 jobs, that means people cannot afford to spend any money with you. And that goes for all of us, right? When the economy starts to go down, we all start to retract and nothing goes well. So our goal is to make sure that not only are our family and our friends and others recognize spending money locally actually really matters, but also you as business owners being mindful of how you're spending money and are you leveraging it well. So shifting gears a little bit, I'm going to talk to you about the things that you need to be doing to make sure that you are in front of this local trend. When Local First Arizona started, there were four coalitions around the country. Today there are over 100, and they're all across the country, and people are more and more and more looking to do business with people that they can know, with locally owned businesses nearby. So the first thing you want to do is make sure you're, you're simply identifying your business as local. A lot of people still aren't doing that. I, I would love to see it on your website. I would love to even see it on your receipts. Any of the materials that you have going on could say thank you for choosing a local alternative, okay? Because truly, more and more choices are in front of your customers every day, and you have to beat down the, the, the wall to make sure that they know that you are a great choice. So thank them, and you put a sign on the wall. Okay, um, make sure you're thanking them regularly. Figure out what your non-local competition is doing. Um, you know, we have a, a, a local retailer, and um, I asked them if they had been in, that there's a big new chain they're comp competing with, and I asked them, have you gone over and looked at it? And their response to me was, no. Like, I wouldn't be caught dead in there. My attitude is, we all need to know what our competition is doing, and we ought to go out and have a good look at it. 
Um, and, and so I just responded because I'm very direct. I said, well, you really should because their parking lot is packed. So what is it that they are doing that's attracting people? So figure out what your non-local competition is doing and get in there and do it better, okay? Um, using local stats to close sales. I always talk about this with our people who have a bigger ticket item. Um, you need to be able to talk about the fact that three times more money stays in Arizona's economy when they choose you. And they use this for car dealerships or people that are selling high-end stereo equipment or anything like that. People need to know that three times more money stays because of the multiplier effect. We just learned about that in the Starbucks slide. Three times more money stays local when they choose you over a non-local competitor. Okay? So I want you to spend some time thinking about what you have right now that people are attracted to. Why are people coming to your business right now? And how do you begin to build on that? When you ask them, you could do a little, in, you know, a very loose survey, ask people why they've chosen your business. Why are you worth a special trip? You may get some answers that you hadn't considered before. And, um, and those are your assets that you can begin to build on. Uh, there are people who might come in that might tell you one of your employees is a, stupid, a superstar, right? And you had no idea. They go out of their way to visit with one of your employees. You need to know that. You need to know if there's some particular brand that you have that causes them to drive all the way out of the way to try you. Uh, if they love your flavors better, if they, they love your anything that you do. We love this because it's fun, whatever it might be. You need to know what sets you apart from everyone else. And I like to remind our local businesses, we spend some money getting a new logo, putting a new brand in place. The honest answer is your brand is what people are saying about you when you're not in the room. So are you the, the place where everybody has an attitude? Are you the place where it's like the friendliest place in the world? Oh, I love going there. Everybody there is so friendly and down to earth. What they're saying about you when you're not in the room is really what your brand is. No matter how much you spent on that beautiful logo or tagline or whatever it is, we got to pay attention to this. Now, a lot of business owners get spooked by negativity, especially in the realm of Yelp and TripAdvisor. And I think it's a great opportunity to get in there and correct the situation. It used to be that people were going to say bad things about their experience with you. Uh, what are the statistics? If they have a good experience, they'll tell three people. And if they have a bad experience, they'll tell seven or something like that. Or maybe it was even 11. Now you have an opportunity to go in and fix it. So I encourage you to make sure that you're staying on top of your social media pages so that you can get in there and fix a situation if somebody didn't have a good experience. So you want to know what do people think of when they think about your business? What is it that pops up for them? We, as a record store, have had to fight back the image of Jack Black, right? And all of that grumpy, oh my god, you're going to buy that? Hey, Joe, get a look at this guy. You know, it's like, no, we are the kindest, most friendly uh, record store out there because it's important for us to pave new ground in, in the friendliness category, okay? So, I'm going to start talking to you, I'm really sorry that this is cut off, it's very unfortunate, but I'm going to start talking to you about talking about who you are. So we're, we're here and we're talking about the why. Now, if I went to all of your pages on your website that said about us, I would be willing to bet that many of you talk about what you do and not why you do it. And there's a big difference. People want to know why you do what you do. Not, it's pretty obvious what you do. It's not obvious you can do the why and the what. But generally speaking, small business owners forget and they talk about what. Okay. So we worked with them. Working with them, their website simply said we sell tires. Okay. We sell tires. The reality is they do so much more than that. And today, they talk about why they're passionate about it, and they also talk about the personal things that they do for the community. They annexed a big dirt lot next to their place over by the Durango Curve, and they plant a garden, a community garden, and they encourage all the kids to come in, and they harvest a salsa garden with the elementary school kids in the neighborhood. I mean, that wasn't even on their website before. Doesn't that make you want to buy your tires from Howard and Pat Fleischman? Right, so now their tagline today, they say, we sell peace of mind for you and your family. That is what they do. They sell peace of mind. They don't sell time. They sell peace of mind. Apple, they don't sell computers. They sell exquisite design. 
So ask yourself why you do what you, what are you passionate about? What drove you to do this? And I encourage you to tell that, and tell that story with personality and flair, because people want to know who you are. Now, on the bottom of this slide, which you can look at if you look on either side over here, you can begin to look at all the different ways that Community Tire and Auto participate in the community. I encourage you to do this as well. If you support a charity, tell us. If you volunteer in the community, tell us where you're engaged. Now, a lot of business owners get pinged all the time, a lot, for, um, for donations, right? So your initial reaction may be, oh my God, I don't want to put that on my website because everybody will ask. But by putting up, these are the charities that we give to, you're specifically defining, defining what you've chosen as your uh, values-aligned charity of choice. You're saying, we give to this charity, um, we give to this charity. These are the, it may be pets, it may be um, women's shelters. Um, what you're doing there is you're telling people simultaneously that we give back, we are rooted in the community, and we're right next to you. Uh, but you're also saying these, this fits our parameter. So if you're not in this parameter, perhaps another uh, company would be a better suit for you. Um, you can change them out all the time, but I recommend that you put them on your website so folks can tell what you give to. Okay? Now the next thing I want you thinking about is this word regional. Um, I want you all, when you leave here tonight, to really be able to think about what the word regional means to your business. Who are you going to be partnering with? How are you going to collaborate? So regional to some companies might be the southwestern United States. Some companies might say regional is in with the state of Arizona. Maybe regional is in the greater Phoenix area. Maybe regional is, you know, the uptown neighborhood in central Phoenix. Maybe regional is the strip mall where there's six businesses that can work together. So think about what customers you're trying to reach, and also think about what kinds of businesses you could be partnering with. Do you want them to be in a geographic boundary, or do you distinctly want to look, at, look beyond that boundary where your customers are and partner with somebody that's outside that boundary? So this word regional is really important for you to define what region you're trying to reach and how you're going to go about doing that. So keep that in mind. Oh, one thing on this slide that I wanted to, to say is a great example. Um, this right over here is a great example of a regional collaboration. Now, that is up in, how many of you have been to wine country up in the Verde Valley, in the Cottonwood area? Anybody? A few of you. Okay. So, thinking independently, they started to recognize that people were only hitting one, two, maybe three of the tasting rooms. Okay? So, over time, they started to think, you know what, well, we could collaborate better on this and really work to um, put a solution in place that works for all of us. So they pooled their resources together and they created the red wine line. And this is a bus that does nothing but take people all around to all the tasting rooms in the whole region. And it's more affordable because they're all collaborating on it. It's much more efficient. And when you go out there, it's like, how great is this? I don't have to worry about driving. I mean, a lot of people would you know, only be able to visit the tasting rooms that were within walking distance. But now, you can head over to Clarkdale, you can zip over uh, to Camp Verde, whatever it might be. Um, that is a great example of a collaboration um, identifying their region. Their region was the Verde Valley. And so, um, that, I love that example. Here's another example where um, this group, uh, they worked across the Tucson and Phoenix region. So um, these two coffee places, Presta and Pesciuto, um, one is in Chandler and the other is in Tucson. They worked together collaboratively, two uh, different coffee roasters, and they created a unique blend that is something that they market as, you know, um, two different distinct regions working together. And th that new blend is actually starting to boom because people like to think of Arizona as let's look at the different regions and how can we reach out across the state to build collaborations. Here's a great example from the Flagstaff area. They have um, multiple different local independent um, um, outdoor sporting goods and recreation stores. And they had never collaborated over the years. They weren't exactly enemies, but they weren't collaborators either. So maybe they would refer another business, but they never actually sat down and worked together until that fateful day that REI announced they were going to come to town and plunk down right in the middle, right? 
So they picked up the phone and they started calling each other and they came up with collaborating with the breweries and they created this event called the Beer and Gear Expo, which is now one of the most popular events in northern Arizona. They reached out to all of the suppliers. Think about that. They reached out. They didn't just say, okay, let's try to throw a party ourselves. They reached out to the suppliers and pitched them, what if you unveiled all of the models for next year at our expo? So that means making sure we've got the newest line of clothes, we've got the, the new um, you know, snowboards, we've got the new skis. This event is off the hook, and of course all of the breweries are promoting it at the same time. So this is a great um, cross-collaboration between different types of businesses that are within the same region. Here are some other examples of community tire and auto again. If you go and get your tire or your, cars, uh, your car worked on, at Community Tire, and it's going to be more than two hours, they will actually give you a ticket to Harkins Theaters and a lift to go watch a movie around the corner, which is a way better idea than sitting in a plastic chair and watching Jerry Springer in the afternoon, right? That is a great collaboration, and they trade on that, and you get special pricing on all of that. Bookman's are a great collaborative idea. They actually created a Twitter treasure hunt, and they reach out to 12 different businesses every year, and they hide um, prizes in their different businesses, and they scatter it out in a pretty big geographic area. The, the, um, all the clues come through on Twitter, and they sent a huge, you know, for my little record store, it's called Stinkweeds, they sent out a clue uh, that their prize was in the back of the book in the weeds. And we have a bookstore, uh, a book rack in the back of the store, and so, you know, I had 30 kids come running in to try to find tickets to a concert. And by the way, Bookman's had those donated, so there's no out-of-pocket cost. This is a great way to build relationships with your neighboring businesses and really get entrenched in the community so that you're participating in something greater than just your one little store. This woman over here runs a tutoring company. Um, she gives $5 gift cards to Bookman's for every student that she has that gets an A. And in exchange, Bookman's promotes her tutoring company to all of their customers. Again, thinking outside the box, how can I begin to collaborate with other businesses? She's just a little at-home tutoring company. She's got this great relationship and a great presence at all of Bookman's locations. And then Bashes has always um, been very, a very good neighbor, and they trade a lot. Um, they trade with Community Tire and Auto. He buys gift certificates for all of his many, many employees there. And in exchange, they market um, them on the, the bags, the, the, the shopping bags um, at the Bash's stores. This is a great example of a collaborative effort that is very small um, and, and compact. These three businesses are right next to each other on McDowell Road. And they do all kinds of cross-promotion amongst themselves. So um, the, the market and um, Palabras is a bookstore. They are constantly marketing for the market and getting people to stay there and also uh, doing coffee next door. And because of their collaborative effort, they've been able to keep their prices down. Um, they just have a general spirit in their little strip mall about, OK, if people are coming here, we want them to stay here and visit all of our businesses. How are we going to go about doing that? This is a great example of eight businesses that came together. They actually rent one large building, and they built out the interior so that each of them have a small section inside. And so it's much, much more affordable for them. They have uh, reduced insurance um, from a, a singular perspective. They have insurance that they can collaborate on for the liability of the whole building. Um, it's, it's, gonna be, it's called Power Plaza. And there are eight different businesses that graduated from our Business Accelerator program. And they cross-promote and work together to bring themselves forward. And so don't feel isolated or like you have to tackle this all on your own. There are opportunities to work with other businesses and even go in on a shared space in an occasion like this. Okay? Here's a great example. Um, the Loft Cinema, I love this example. They're an independent movie house in Tucson. They actually partnered with this group, Technicians for Sustainability, and they've created a van that they both invested in. It is solar powered, and they um, can go out with their batteries that are solar charged and show a three hour movie remotely. So if you wanted to have a party in your backyard, or if you wanted to have a community meeting and show a film, they're doing a whole bunch in exchange for our, our in uh, collaboration with the school districts. They can actually come right out and show a movie. And it's pretty amazing to hear them talk about it, that if people have only ever been exposed to mainstream movies, when they see a really good independent film, they are just floored. 
And they're also doing a lot by um, sharing different cultures and showing movies in other languages to specific groups of people. So that's a fantastic example of a collaborative effort. And meanwhile, Technicians for Sustainability are showing how mobile and um, user-friendly their solar panels can be and what they can accomplish with independent businesses. This is a great example that was started by um, the woman, uh, her name is Charlene Badman. She decided that we didn't have enough healthy food in the school. She's a restaurateur and a, an amazing chef that runs F&B in Scottsdale. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. But she decided to get involved by bringing in a whole bunch of chefs that now they go out into the schools and talk to students about how important it is for them to eat healthy. So if you have a chef come in in their full uniform to talk about careers in the culinary world and the importance of nutrition, it impacts the kids in a whole other way because now it's not just their parents telling them. It is a professional coming in and talking to them about having a well-balanced meal. And so what that's doing for all of these chefs is creating relationships with those children and their parents. They do a parent-teacher conference. They would like to partner with this school district to build awareness around health and nutrition. So this is just a chef who decided to go out and proactively do it. And now um, the whole neighborhood where she's working wants to hoist her up on the shoulders and carry her around because they love her so much and they now want to support her business as well. This is a great example, and I'm actually going to read this to you because I want to really underscore how important it is that we show our personality. Too often we are just sort of, yeah, this is what we do, and you know, this is, you know, choose us or, or not, this is the best we can do. This is funny, and this is, um, this is a restaurant that decided to partner with a local brewery in Tucson. So every Thursday, I'm reading this from their website, every Thursday we point a spotlight on a certain Iron John's beer while owner and brewmaster John Atkinson hangs around to answer your questions about brewing, drinking, life, love, happiness, organic chemistry, ad hoc systems engineering, bookkeeping, small business human resources, and bottle washing. Right, and so now you're going, all right, this is hilarious, this is fun, this is hilarious, I'm going to go out to this restaurant and try and just hang out. And they've created a whole hilarious uh, regular event that people come out to focused on this brewmaster and what he's doing. So this is a partnership that's pretty unique. Um, and again, this business is truly benefiting from the partnership and the brewery is truly benefiting from the partnership as well. Now, this is the gentleman that owns Barrio Bread. Um, again, this one is an incredibly popular uh, bakery. They actually had lines down the street. Um, and in order to make his bread more available, he formed a partnership with the co-op. And so the co-op is now an outlet for his bread. So you no longer have to just stand in line at Barrio Bread. You know that you can find fresh baked bread twice a day um, at the... Um, at the co-op in Tucson. Uh, another amazing example, Santan Brewing just inked a big deal with the Coyotes for a new brand of beer that they're creating. Now this is about building relationships. It's about picking up the phone and making those phone calls and saying, hey, I would like to partner with you. Would you meet with me to brainstorm this? I had a great idea and I would like to see if I could sit down and brainstorm it. Santan Brewing, homegrown right out of Chandler. Um, this is a big stretch for them, and they're, they're killing it. They're actually killing it with this new one. Um, this is a great example with um, the development community. Now, this is um, a group of developers. They are coming together under the Local First Umbrella. It's a program that we run called Forum. But they actually came forward with this idea to put together an expo. What we're doing here is you've got developers that are building restaurants, that are building housing complexes. They all have a desire to go local, but they don't know where to meet landscapers. They don't know where to meet really great iron guys or glass guys or whatever it might be. So we brought them together in an expo. This is something that a local business could do. Uh, just like George Ann Bryan over at Francis Boutique, she runs uh, Indie Cafeteria, where she actually proactively goes out and finds all the best um, people who are doing handmade goods and brings them together for an expo. People love when they can go visit a place and meet all these different people at the same time. Same thing with um, our effort around the Farmer and Chef Connection. The Farmer and Chef Connection is a group of uh, food producers 
It can be people that are making anything from honey to jellies to jams to actually growing cattle uh, to you know growing produce and everything in between. We put them together in a huge expo type atmosphere and then we invite all the restaurants and hoteliers and others who are interested in sourcing more locally. So this is something that you as independent businesses could actually be doing is bringing everybody together. Okay, and then um, here's a good example of how a local company, um, Hensley Beverage, they go out of their way to um, market and promote themselves as local. They are in a fiercely competitive environment. They have three major competitors. None of them are local, just in beverage distribution. So um, those three other companies, this is something that Hensley can do that sets them apart. And then we can go out to those restaurants and remind them how important it is to spend their money with a distribution company that is based here in Arizona. Why is that important? Because Hensley supports not only the employees they have here, but the ecosystem of jobs that they support, whether it's accountants or graphic designers or website developers. They put Arizona to work. In addition, they give to the charities here, and they are an engine in the way that their non-local competitors won't be able to touch. So this is a good example about how they really leverage their, um, you know, our tagline is think local, buy local, be local. They leverage that wherever they can. They do it in their advertising, etc. Now here's a t-shirt company called State 48 that has done an amazing job of going out into the community and partnering with nonprofit organizations. And I mean really partnering. So they're, they're designing t-shirts that are um, to benefit those charities that they're partnering with. And then the revenue gets split. So with State 48, they put Localist on there, which is our brand. Um, this is something that we worked on together. This is the best selling t-shirt either of us have had. And it's pretty remarkable that um, you know, we totally collaborated on the design, and we totally collaborate on the sales, and we totally collaborate on the revenue share as well. So this is a way for State 48 to get the word out as a relatively new t-shirt company. Now we're going to shift and talk a little bit about the arts, because I believe that local business could be leveraging the arts to think really creatively and cleverly about how to get yourself to stand out. So with yarn bombing, um, these are just examples of a community that came together um, to do trees. You could do, if you have a physical location, actually decorating the trees. There's nobody that's going to drive by that street that's not going to see that, okay? Um, decorating a bench that's in front of your business, decorating a bike rack that's in front of your business. These are things that sort of stand out and make you, um, give you personality and character, okay? Um, this example over here, um, this is a collaboration between the businesses downtown in Greensboro, North Carolina where they hired a local artist to create a whole bunch of these small brass mice and then they hid them all throughout the downtown and there's an app where you can actually find all the clues to find those mice. So if your region that you're working in is in a particular neighborhood, bring all the businesses in and see if you could come up with some sort of clever way to partner with arts and culture to create a game or any sort of exercise that you know, that's become their brand. I mean, Greensboro, the tourism office, you know, they've got the logo and the tagline, but Greensboro is now known for the town with the little brass mice because that's what everybody thinks of. And you see people walking around with their phones and they're like four, five, six, seven, and then look up and then they find uh, where uh, the little brass mice is hidden. So plenty, plenty of things that we can do around arts and culture. Another thing I want to identify is going with the flow. When you see that there are a certain kind of customer that's seeking you out, how do you reach more people like that? Now this guy recognized, he is all the way out in Pima, Arizona at the Taylor Freeze. And he recognized that he was having a lot of cyclists. He might, there were a lot of cyclists coming by. Now he didn't set out to reach cyclists, but when he started to recognize that cyclists were always coming by, he decided that he put a wall in his business. He takes Polaroid pictures of all the cyclists as they come through, and they put a red pushpin uh, wherever they came from on a map, a red pushpin on a map to show where they came from. And now people come from all over, and you can't go by that place without seeing cyclists. It's like, it's like an achievement, you know, through uh, Facebook to get your picture on the wall at the Taylor Freaks. And so now he's partnering in the region. There are cycling races and things like that. And it opened up a whole world for him where he wasn't, I mean, he's an ice cream. And you know, it's, it's basically the whole concept is very similar to a Tasty Freezer and Dairy Queen. 
but he's an independent and he's booming out there because he's got all kinds of partnerships and uh, unique ways to be uh, driving people into his business. Now, some of you may recognize this is the inside of my gallery. It's called Modified Arts. Um, how many of you remember what Roosevelt Row was like in the late 90s? Anybody? Okay. It was pretty rough when uh, I opened up Modified there. Um, there were a lot of vacant and uh, blighted buildings around. There was a hubcap shop and a liquor store there. Um, and people said that will never work. And um, so what I did at my store, at my gallery, is to, in order to build awareness about what we were doing, I actually handmade my invitations. And I mailed them out every month. Now you'll think I'm crazy, but I handmade 500 invitations every month for five years. And I mailed them out to everybody in arts and culture that I knew of. I mailed them out to the head of SMOCA. I mailed them out to the head of the, you know, the public arts program at, at, uh, at the city of Phoenix. I mailed them out to the instructors at ASU in the art department. And they started getting these things in every month. And who can ignore? Wow, you know, they keep sending me these hand. I mean, I'm out in my yard at home with my paints, you know, make you know, huge butcher paper and then cut them into small pieces and put them into plastic bags with the information about the art exhibition. So it became a thing, and people started collecting those because it was such an interesting thing. And um, so I actually did an exhibition of my invites just a few years ago um, so that you could see all 60 of those invites that were handmade that went out over time. So I was there for about a year and a half by myself um, on Roosevelt, and we used to have First Friday, and I'd be excited if we get two or 300 people to come out to the opening. Um, this was the only marketing and advertising I ever did was the handmade invitations that I made out, that I mailed out. So about a year and a half later, uh, I had a, a friend now, he's a friend, but a guy came in and he was kind of looking a little sheepish. I could tell something was on his mind. I said, what's up? And he said, eh, would you be mad if my wife and I opened up an art gallery right next door? Now think about that. Would you be mad? No, this is my blighted and burned out stretch of downtown Phoenix, <laughs> you know? Um, no, of course, absolutely, of course, I would. I just jumped up and I hugged him. Is basically what happened. So now we got two people, and we're you know promoting this whole First Friday thing. And then the third person came along and opened up a, a, a panini and wine bar across the street. And I thought, man, now there's three of us. We got two art galleries and some wine. We got a destination, right? Just like two people rubbing sticks together to try to start a fire. That's how it happens. And some of you may know how this story plays out. But over the next 12 years, we ended up with 22 galleries, five restaurants, a few wine bars, some retailers, and a light rail stop that says Arts District, okay? So super important that we recognize how these things can get started, and also if we start thinking about the collaboration that it took. Now, I'm gonna undo this for a minute. Let's go back. Now imagine if that second guy, guy number two, had not thought about collaborating. And what if he didn't come over and say, I don't want to do First Friday, I'm going to do Second Saturdays. So guy number two is not promoting First Friday, he's promoting Second Saturday. And then the guy across the street was like, you guys are both nuts, I'm going to stick on my own side of the street and I'm going to do First Wednesdays. Or whatever. Now it sounds ridiculous because you know how the story played out, but I see this happen amongst business owners all the time. We tend to, you know, we're entrepreneurs, so we, we're used to going at it alone. But the reality is we've got to check our ego at the door and begin thinking about this, okay? Um, First Friday today is 30,000 people, and it has been at that size for many years. Um, it got voted one of the best uh, top 10 arts districts in the country by USA Today. And that, that is definitely not a story about me. That is a story about the power of collaboration and how businesses can work together. Now here's another example. Now you may think this is, a, this is my record store here called Stinkweeds. This is a women's clothing boutique called Francis, and then you have Halo, which is a piercing place, and you have Arizona Hi-Fi. You know, their average ticket sale is probably between three and $5,000. It's a high-end stereo store. Over here, when we did this promotion, we had Red Hot Robot. They're not there today, but they were like a Japanese figure in a collectible store. And at the end, we had Smeeks, and Smeeks was a candy store. So over here, you've got second graders at a birthday party, and down here, you've got Pearson. You may not think that we would ever be able to collaborate. But we actually hired an artist to actually paint this of our building, spruce it up a little bit, and, and, and created a postcard. 
Um, and then we named ourselves Medlock Plaza. We, we were just a bunch of ramshackle bu buildings next to each other, but now we're Medlock because it's a destination. Um, and then we, we set out and did this whole campaign called Unique Gifts Six Ways. We don't care who's in your family, we've got something for you, right? And so what we wanted to do was to make sure that when anybody, any hard load of people was going to be setting out to do any sort of shopping whatsoever, that they knew that they could come to Medlock Plaza and divide and conquer, right? We got something for everybody. So that's an example of a bunch of advertising that I never, ever would have been able to afford on my own. Okay? So I want to also point out that I don't want you to just to feel like you have to compete on price. It's not necessarily about price. People want to have a great experience. Make sure you're focused on customer service to the, to the maximum amount that you can be. That we, you're not in your business, that anybody that you hire has customer service on the brain. Because customer service is what can set you apart. It is getting harder and harder and harder to compete for dollars. So you need to make sure that your business is, uh, that your customers have a very, very unique experience, okay? Um, having more expertise on staff. Um, this is something, you know, in, the, the, in my store, the employee that's been with me the least amount of time has been there 11 years. The amount of musical knowledge that we have in our customer, in our uh, employee base is remarkable. So stack me up next to Best Buy any day of the week because Best Buy is not going to be able to compete with us on musical knowledge or customer service, right? I, I'll tell you a funny story. I had a kid who came in and he was, again, looking around the store and I could tell he was looking for something and I said, hey, is there something I can help you with? And he said, no. And I left him alone for a little while, and after a while I said, come on, you're looking for something. He said, well, I'm kind of embarrassed. I said, no, tell me. He said, I'm trying to put together a mixtape uh, of, of songs for my girlfriend, and I want it to all to be about love. And I was like, oh, so you made the face I did, not that sweet? I was like, come over here. I put a bar stool out for him, and I sat there for an hour playing records and listening, you know, and we were listening to things together, and he left with a stack of stuff. And as he was leaving, he had his hand on the door, and he looked back at me, and he said, I wonder what would happen if I had asked that question at Best Buy, right? And well, there's my ad. I mean, I have the ability to really show care and concern for my customer and sit down with them and make sure they have an incredible experience, okay? A wider variety, this is something we can also crush it on. Even though they may have more inventory than you, you have the ability to deliver things that they don't, they're not touching. So seeking out those little, um, the, the customers that are looking for that unique um, item, whatever it might be, could be anything from the hardware store all the way to the different types of pavers to uh, the different types of things, services that you provide. Going the extra mile. Now this one is near and dear to my heart because I can't say enough how tough business is going to be in the world in 10 years. And that we have to all be willing to go the extra mile to retain our customer. Our customer dollars are getting spread thin. So we need to work to make sure that we're going the extra mile. So my favorite story, um, teaching a, a customer service in a rural area one time. I, uh, I asked, I started by saying, who here has sent out a nasty gram? Who here has uh, had a rotten customer service experience and you've gone back and you've, uh, you've told them, you know? And, I did once with an airline and they sent me a robotic response which actually made me even madder because um, I had a really rotten experience and they just were like, you know, here's our standard form letter. Well, this woman raised her hand and she said, I, you know, I live in a rural town. I was after work. I was going home. I ran into our local grocery store and I'm telling you, Kimber, she said, I just needed the basics. I, I, my list was like butter, bread, eggs, and milk. I swear. That was it. And I went into that store and they didn't have any of it. And I was furious. And I went home and I sent that manager a nasty gram. Okay? Again, small town, she knew who he was, but she unleashed. You know, do you, you call yourself a grocer. Like, this is pathetic. So, what do you think that manager did 45 minutes later when he got that email? He showed up on her doorstep with her groceries. He showed up on her doorstep. Now, do you think she's a customer for life? Okay. She's telling that story, and now I'm telling that story here to you. Now, he said, I am so sorry, standing there on her doorstep. I had all the merchandise. I had three people call in sick. I was trying to catch everybody at the front door, but I must have missed you. 
and I'm horribly sorry, right? This is what, this is the power. This is what the local business can offer, which is going the extra mile. And I can't underscore how important that is going to be going forward in the world of business. Now, being convenient and consistent. Consistency, man, does it get on my nerves when I try to go to a local business and they're closed, when their hours say right there, they're supposed to be open. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. If your website says you're going to be there for certain hours, be there for certain hours. Be consistent. Um, I, uh, I work with a lot of rural towns today, and I do a lot of things like um, Secret Santas, where I can go in and work with a tourism department to, to help them understand where the weaknesses are in their, in their town. So imagine you spent all of your marketing budget to get people to visit your town, and then when people visit your town, they have a crass, crappy experience at the local businesses. Wouldn't that be infuriating? So we have the head of a tourism uh, organization, and they, um, they flat out lost their minds and said, we bring in buses of people, and half of our stores are closed in the middle of the day. What, what can we do? So I went out and I started working um, with those businesses. I started doing a little secret Santa. The funniest thing is, you know, one of the businesses I went in, here's me, you know, totally anonymous, making my way down the street. First door, locked. Second door, locked. Third door, I'm like, are they open? Because the lights are out. I open the door. I was like, oh. I step in. Well, the woman jumps up and she turns on the lights. I was like, all right. And then I proceed to look around her store. She doesn't say anything. And I get to leave and I say, all right, have a good day. And she goes, you too. Turns out the lights and sits down again. How awkward and weird is that, right? Just kind of like beepy. So I go to the next door. They're open. I walk in, I go, how you doing? About the guys about this far away. And he goes, fine. Well, what is that? Like, you're a retailer, right? So I'm like, all right, whatever, dude. So I'm looking around, I pick something up, I go, these are cute, are they made locally? And he goes, nope. <laughs> so you get my point. I don't care how big your tourism budget is. If you bring people in and that is what you're offering, it isn't going to work. Because people are not going to come back. And people are going to post something on TripAdvisor or Yelp, don't go to that town, man. What a bunch of weirdos, right? The third store I went in, nobody asked what I, she just sat there chatting with her friend the whole time. So we need to be very mindful of our level of customer service and what we're doing. Um, another, I'll just give you another example is I hired somebody to, to trim the tree at my house. Big, huge pine tree. Well, I came home, and he had trimmed the tree all right, but he had trimmed it completely lopsided. So, and I could not understand for the life of me, why did you take off that limb over there and make the tree look like it's now like this, right? So I had to call him up and get him back out there, not necessarily just to complain, but to have him explain his logic, which he was able to do. However, be, but if I hadn't made the effort to reach out to him to get him over here to explain, he really should have proactively called me and said, here's what I am going to do, and I want you to be aware of it so that when you get home, you're not completely shocked out of your mind and thinking, why did I make your tree so lopsided, right? So we need to be thinking from the customer's perspective at all times about what their experience is going to be so that we can make sure we're delivering on all counts. Another example, another Main Street example, um, in Glendale, Old Town Glendale, they were trying to be a, an antique district. Only two of their biggest stores used to think nothing about sticking a sign in the window that says, gone fishing, you know, ha ha. And the businesses came to me and said, you know, we're, it's killing us. People are coming from over, all over, and we're not a district if, if some of us are closed. So we created a sticky note campaign. We, we gave everybody sticky notes. And um, if you saw somebody yanking on the door of one of those closed businesses, go out there and leave a sticky note. And the sticky note, the only rule is there's no swearing, OK? But the owners of the businesses that were open would be like, oh, I see that you were trying to get in that store here. Leave them a note. Leave them a note. Leave them a note. We had sticky notes by the door. Well, they would show up on Monday morning, and there'd be like 20 notes on there. I came to buy that desk. I can see it in the window, but I decided to buy something from your neighbor instead. Um, I came out all the way from wherever, wherever, and I'm not coming back because you guys were, weren't open, and your website said you would be. So pretty soon, they started hiring um, their, their family members to be in there so that um, they were consistent. Okay, So think about your neighbors and how you can collaborate with them to set certain hours. 
Uh, another frustrating thing is when businesses are in the same area but they have totally different hours, it's not convenient for the customer. It's not conducive to somebody coming into your, your area. Okay? So I'm going to wrap it up here and open it up for some questions. Um, I'd love to have a conversation with any of you about your business. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, but I wanted to just hit, this is, these are the different programs that we run through Local First Arizona. I don't know where they might apply to you, so I'm just going to run through them really quickly. So Local First Arizona is our business coalition. Fuerza Local is our Spanish uh, uh, membership and a business accelerator program. The Localist program is our individuals who support locally owned businesses. They get very excited about supporting businesses like yours. So you may even want to look at um, having your staff become localists to get them out and become ambassadors of your business into other local businesses to build awareness about who you are and what you do. Good Food Finder is a statewide directory of local, locally produced foods and it's a marketplace for restaurant chefs and others who are looking to source more locally. Devour Local, Devour Phoenix is our restaurant coalition. We run the, um, the uh, Devour uh, Culinary Festival. This year it's going to be at the Desert Botanical Garden. It brings together the top chefs in the region. Um, Weekend Zona is our opportunity for us to work together to get people out exploring the state. How many of you knew that Arizonans spend six and a half billion dollars a year vacationing in California? Right? What if we could just redirect 10% of that into staycations and keeping people here, um, maybe even just going across town to have a unique experience? Okay. Local First Arizona Foundation is an organization uh, that we founded in 2009. It's a 501c3 nonprofit charity organization that works to build a stronger Arizona uh, economy and to grow opportunities for all. Okay. Um, Forum, I mentioned that earlier, Forum is our program that brings the development community together and those people that are working with the built environment. So they're always going to be looking for companies to do business with. It can be masons, it can be woodworkers, it can be landscapers, anything like that. And then finally we have the Arizona Rural Development Council. We merged with the Rural Development Council in 2013. So if you're a business that identifies the state of Arizona as your region and you're trying to market to people around the state of Arizona, we, you may want to sign up for our newsletter so that you can see where different events and things are happening around the state. We do uh, the Rural Policy Forum and quite a number of events around. So, um, so I'm going to open it up. And